Yeah, we're. This is 2OF Entertainment. Welcome to the Lost Dollar Business Club, where we talk about business, 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 and not just business. We talk about what makes businesses go up and what makes businesses go down. If you're interested in businesses, this is where it is. We talk about the global economy. We talk about global politics. We talk about everything and anything business related that affects your life on a global scale as well as a local scale. And don't miss after the show, Lost and Found. We are live, Stephen and John. Wow, who knew? So yeah, knew. going live on today's, uh, you know, the the Lost Dollar Business Club first time going live. This is great. And the the interesting part with this will be is that there's like a thirty second delay. Because, so because of that, um, your, some of the questions when we read them, if we get any, they'd be a little behind the curveball, but it's okay. All right, but so, yeah, well let's let's uh, let's make sure that our audience knows you can now interact with us on our yeah. YouTube channel. So yeah. send in your questions as we're talking with our guests today, or don't. Either way, it works for us. Yeah, again, we're, yeah, we do enough live shows that uh, we don't really care what you people think. So uh, there you go. But today, it's not just us. It's not the three Muscatels. We have a very interesting guest. Oh, yeah. And We've I got a British him. labor economist, Guy Standing, yeah. not only a professor at the university. He's a stand-up guy, by the way, just so yeah. you know. He's a stand-up stand guy. Stand guy. <laughs> stand guy. I can see him shaking his head in the green room going, ah, oh, it's going to be a long uh -huh. interview, guy. It is going to be a good one. <laughs> uh, but he's also the co-founder of the Basic Income Earth Network. Right. So this is this is the man who, termed, who created the term precariat to describe the emerging class of workers who are harmed by low wages and poor job security as a consequence of globalization. And we've talked about globalization many times on this show, yeah. thanks to uh, Michael Collins and many other guests. So this will be a very exciting, uh, very exciting show to talk about the precariat, the Basic Income Earth Network, um, and, and Guy's actually written many books uh, right. on structural adjustment and, and social protection, la labor markets. So we can dive right into it. Yeah, he's like our third right. famous guest between Michael sure. and uh, uh, Drew uh, dot com. So there you go. Yeah. So, but, uh, yeah John, John, anytime you can wake up whenever you want. Okay. Right, you ready right. to bring Guy in? There we go. Let's bring in Guy. Guy, how are you? Very nice to be on the show. I'm looking forward to it. And um, that introduction, I, I could change it quite a bit, but we won't. Let's go straight no. into the questions. <laughs> I, look yeah. forward to it. I look forward to this because um, I'm, I'm speaking from Geneva, Switzerland, and it's been a, we just had a huge storm, but it's cleared up now, so I'm ready, and I don't think there'll be any noise in the background. Right. No worries. We hear you loud and clear, and thank you for joining us, Guy. I mean, very much. I, uh, I came across your book, The Precariat, uh, some time ago, maybe last year, and read through it, uh, and just felt like this is a really important concept for the 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 challenges of the modern economy and we're we're based in the u.s but we do talk about the globalization issues that come from from what a lot of multinationals have done and what the labor markets have done so why don't you give us give us the uh the the first idea about the precariat and some of your some of your uh, your thoughts on on how that emerged well i think it's uh michael i think it's good to start with the economic background that uh precedes uh, the, the development of the precariat. Essentially, as you probably know, and perhaps your previous programs have discussed it, we had an economics revolution back in the late 70s and early 80s, which ushered in Ronald Reagan in the US, Margaret Thatcher in my own country, Britain, and similar politicians around the world. And this was led by a group of renegades who'd been setting up the Mont Pelerin Society in 1947, they were regarded for many years as a bunch of right-wing uh, relics of the past. But suddenly they became super popular and they ushered in a free market era led by people like Frederick Hayek and Milton Friedman and so on. And essentially what they wanted to do was create a free market economy in the world. This was their credo. They, they were anti-socialist. They were anti-social democrat. And the irony of, of history is that they introduced this and basically anti-union, anti-institutions of solidarity. And the, the irony is that what we've seen develop in the last 50 years 
is what I've called in my books rentier capitalism. It's a capitalism where more and more of the income flows to the owners of property, uh, physical property, financial property, and intellectual property. And they've created an ar international architecture which gives strength to property owners. And what's happened globally, and it's happened in China as much as in the United States and as much as in Europe and Japan, everywhere, is that the people relying on labor and work have been receiving a declining share of national income. Yes. And this has gone along with the creation of what's been called flexible labor markets. And I was in the United Nations for many years, working all over the world, and I saw this, saw this development taking place. And I argued from back in the 1980s that this agenda was going to lead to chronic inequalities and chronic economic insecurities of various types, and that it, would in, that it would produce a new global class structure, not the old Marxian class structure of the 19th century or what Max Weber talked about, a famous sociologist that you probably know, but a new class structure in which there would be a plutocracy at the top, tiny, tiny number of multi-billionaires, below which would be an elite of multi-millionaires, both groups making most of their money from forms of rent, from property, from stock exchanges and so on, a declining salariat, that number of people in permanent, full-time, salaried employment with pensions and paid holidays and paid this, that and the other, and a declining old working class, the proletariat, for which the welfare states both in the United States and in Europe and elsewhere, had been built for that group of mainly male, full-time uh, workers in stable jobs. This was shrinking. And below that was the precariat. And I'll come to the definition in a second. But I wrote the book that you just mentioned in 2011, at the early 2011. And I said on page one, of the first edition, that if the politicians and commentators didn't begin to understand the needs and aspirations of the precariat, we would see the emergence of a political monster. We would see a politics of inferno in which the more and more of the dissatisfaction would start feeding into a, a rather unsavory politics. And I defined the precariat in three dimensions. And unfortunately, many, many commentators have only focused on the first dimension. But the book has had a life of its own. It's taken me to over 42 countries, I think 43 countries. I've given about 700 talks on it. And it's gone into five editions and been translated into 25 languages. Now, I, I assure you that that doesn't happen to a boring economist. It's very strange. <laughs> it sort of changed my life and uh, led me to receive deluges of emails, good, bad and indifferent from all over the world, uh, as many from the United States as anywhere else, but uh, it, from everywhere you can imagine. And the definition was that first people in their millions were going to have unstable, insecure jobs in which they would have no occupational narrative to give to their lives. They're living bits and pieces lives. They have a level of education which is above what is required on average for the sort of jobs they have to do. This is unprecedented mm -hmm historically. And they have to do a lot of work that is not regarded as work, it's not measured, it's not in our labor statistics. They have to do that work, like retraining, searching for short-term jobs, waiting, queuing for benefits, or whatever it is. They have to do all those forms of work, or they pay a pay heavy price, and they can easily be pushed down into the underclass of social people dying in the streets and so on. 
So that first definition, first dimension, is allied with a second dimension, which is that this is the first mass class in history, and I've documented this in subsequent books, that's had to rely mainly on money wages. They don't get access to paid holidays or other forms of non-wage benefit. They don't have the prospect of a good pension. They don't get paid, paid medical leave. They don't get various other benefits. But they, they not only have to rely on money wages, but they're in conditions of living on the edge of unsustainable debt. Mm -hmm. And this is unprecedented as a systemic feature of capitalism. We've never had that before. We've always had it debt, but not as a systematic feature of working class life. And that means that people are very fearful because they're being exploited through debt mechanism and finance wants people to be in debt. That's how they make their money. But at the same time, they're losing state benefits, no entitlement to guaranteed state benefits, and they've lost these other forms of benefits. And they've also been losing the commons about which I've written. We may come back to that. But it leads to the third dimension. And the third dimension is the most important. And it's the, the dimension get, that's least mentioned by casual commentators in newspapers. And I must have been interviewed by hundreds of newspapers. Mm. And again and again and again, they, they, they don't mention this, which is that this group is losing the rights of citizenship. They're losing mm -hmm. social they're losing cultural rights. They're losing civil rights. And what this leads to is people in the precariat think of themselves as supplicants. The original Latin for precaria, precarity was to obtain by prayer, to obtain by having to ask for favors, to ask for discretionary judgments, whether it's landlords, employers, parents, or whatever. You have to rely on begging in effect and this dimension is every time i give a talk with a large number of people in the precariat in the audience they'll immediately put their hand up and say yeah that's me that's me that's what i have to experience so these things combine to produce an existential crisis of insecurity and anxiety the four a's i discuss in the book anomie sense of hopelessness, alienation, they have to do things they don't want to do and they can't do what they would like to do, a sense of anxiety all the time, and most importantly, a sense of anger. Mm -hmm. And that is what's happening around the world, that combination of those A's. And there, that's the definition. And I'll, we can come back to what's happened since 2011, but I'm convinced now that a very large percentage of people are either in the precariat in various countries or on the edge of being in it. And we're talking about millions of people all across the world uh, who were previously in positions that were not the precariat. Maybe they were in the salaried class or they were in classes where they had uh, some sort of professional protections, and now that's not the case. Um, you talk about. You talk about the, the, the idea that this came out of the, 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 the desires of those who wanted a free market, but I think it's important to note that you make a, a solid point that there, there hasn't even been a true free market. There hasn't, the, 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 it's been an illusion that there has been a free market, even though many, many politicians who've probably benefited from it have been saying that we do have a, a free market. And this goes ties into a little bit of your rentier capitalism idea and the corruption of capitalism book. But uh, can, you, can you just explain that a little bit for our, uh, our viewers about this illusion of the free market and maybe how it, it never really yeah. existed? I mean, there are two features that I want to emphasize. This is what we have today is probably the most unfree market economy that's ever existed. Okay. <laughs> And the first thing that happened was that financial market liberalization in the 1980s has created a situation where financial corporations are hugely popular. The top of the pile is BlackRock. Okay, BlackRock, through its algorithm of uh, Aladdin, 
effectively controls 20% of the world's stocks. 20% of the world's stocks. And it can manipulate that with, with relative ease. And the finance has helped big corporations to buy up other companies. Companies have become commodities. So one of the things that's happened in this era is that big monopolies have have emerged. Now, the, the original people in the Mont Pelerin Society said, you don't need to worry about monopolies because there'll be competition and the competition will get rid of monopolies very quickly. But that, that is underestimating two things. One is finance and the other is the intellectual property rights system. And what happened in 1994, aided by George W. Bush, but ironically by led by the chief executive of Pfizer, the, the chemical company that did rather well out of COVID, they organized that the, the GATT in Geneva, I was there at the time, would pass what's called TRIPS, the trade-related mm -hmm. aspects of intellectual property. And this effectively globalized the US intellectual property rights system, okay? Mm -hmm. And what this did first and foremost, it enabled corporations to gain from patents. Before 1994, fewer than 1 million patents were registered each year. Today, it's well over 3 million a year and over mm -hmm. 16 million patents are in force. What's that? A patent gives the owner a corporation or an individual, but usually a corporation, a monopoly income for 20 years. Nobody can produce a product that is patented unless I say so if I've got the patent. And they, what's happened is the big tech, big pharma, big finance, and big other uh, industries as well, they buy up companies mainly for their intellectual property rights because they can put that with their existing stock of, of patents or copyrights or industrial designs, string it together and make well above what would happen in a free market. They, can, they make huge mm -hmm. profits as a result. It's a form of rent, right? So that what's happened globally, and I'll give data for that, is the markup of prices over production costs has hugely grown because they can hold up the prices well above cost. There's no competition. It's it's stopping the competition. And backing that up, countries, particularly the United States, Biden has taken it to a new level, are giving subsidies to their champions, their big corporations, that, that they can maintain their dominance against the champions of other countries. So you have it particularly now, this battle between the United States and China. And, and this is the, the, the big geopolitical tension over the next few years is going to be that the United States is a declining rentier state. China is a rising rentier state. And the people who negotiated trips underestimated the Chinese because in 1994, China was not in the World Trade Organization that came into being as a result of trips. China was out of it. China only joined in 2001, and they didn't reckon in China joining. Now, since China joined, they've got onto the same train of patents and property rights, and now China registers each year more patents than the United States and Europe put together. So that wow. they are the rising rentier capacity, and that's the geopolitical tension. And you're, we've just seen new measures from the Biden administration uh, trying to increase protectionism. Well, the Chinese will respond and the Europeans will have to respond. And it, it's analogous to what happened in the 1930s, that, that, that but, this is a dangerous place. But this becomes almost isolationist because, right, because as I go global and go look how wonderful I am, other companies do the same. And then all of a sudden we pull back. And that's this, what's going on now between China and the U.S., you know, we kicked in everybody's door, if you will, from the 1950s until last week. And now all of a sudden, we're not as strong as we used to be. And China came along. And we did a show last week with Michael Collins, who's a famous economist as well, 
about the MFN for China. So, and that was the topic. It's sort of like, you know, we game the system for the last 50 years very well. And the Chinese have gamed it better. At the end of the day, that's really what it boiled down to. And when you talk about patents, if you will, it's basically, a, it, to, your, to your point earlier, it's a form of a lease, right? I, I have a patent. You want to use it? I'll let you use it for $100 million a year. That's and right. I don't have to develop anything. So that's to right. your other point, I don't really need people. So it really becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy about your dimensions and what your book is saying. It's just that's it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. At some point, you don't need anybody. Well, the, you, they need people, but they, they can use people and, and exploit them even more effectively. I mean, the, right. the, the thing with the China, uh, a U.S. Uh, conflict or competition, I us hope it never reaches conflict, but right. it, it is a case of the Chinese now outsmarting uh, U.S. soft power in developing countries in particular. I mean, the Belt and Braces uh, rode the Chinese uh, tactics of lending to countries and gradually acquiring their capital because they've got this huge capital surplus from their exports from the last 30 years, uh, means that, that they have a built-in advantage now. And sadly, the, the United States is dissipating its soft power particularly the way it's supporting Israel at the moment, for example, that's going down like a lead balloon across the world. And it's losing a lot of people's respect for the United States and their their capacity to be an independent arbiter of state. So there's this real crisis mm -hmm. for the Americans in terms of their, their role in the world. And, right. and this, this is going to have to be confronted by the new president uh, but it's part of this unfolding crisis of rentier capitalism. It's that it's an, unless there can be international negotiations to change the structures, dismantle many of the forms of, of rentier capitalism, then then I think the situation is going to become even more tense. I know yeah. it's me. Go ahead, Michael. And I know it's very simplistic to say this, but I but I know that this is what I, what some of our listeners might might talk about is that well doesn't intellectual property rights foster innovation don't they don't they foster innovation and without them that we would lose some sort of competitive edge in whatever market two we're things, playing two things here michael the the evidence uh which i summarize in in the book you've mentioned corruption mm -hmm. and capitalism the evidence is that since the strengthening of intellectual property rights the rate of innovation has gone down it, right. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons is that many patents are taken out simply to stop anybody producing those goods or those with those techniques because they would be competing with the existing products that a company has got. So many, many patents are taken out for purely defensive reasons. Uh, second, many of the patents are the result of government funded research. Mm -hmm. It's you and me who takes the risk, okay? Most In most countries, governments hugely undercut the risks. It was the same with the COVID vaccines, okay? If it hadn't been for governments taking the risk, we bore the risk, okay? They make the profit, we bear the risk. And there is no evidence from international studies, US studies, European studies, that any uh, positive effect of the growth of patents has, and industrial designs has taken place. It's actually that's a really slowed important. the rate of interest. Yeah. No, that's a really important yeah. point. So then how would, how would we have to, at a global scale, change the intellectual property regime to at least soften it a little bit so that there can be real competition, real innovation, real moving away from the rentier approach? Well, I think I think the first thing the first thing is to make uh, the duration of uh, patents and, mm. and copyright much shorter. Instead of twenty years, if it's if it's the company or the individual who's taken all the risk, they could have up to ten years. If it's publicly funded research, there should be five or two years. Okay, because we've taken the risk. The second thing with copyright, I mean, copyright is now ridiculous. 
It used to be that copyright, you had copyright for 14 years. And if you were still alive, you could go and make an appeal and have a further 14 years. Many generations, that was the rule. Now it's for the whole of the life of the person plus 70 years or 95 years in some cases. Okay. Now I don't know what people are going to do with that uh, copyright after they're dead. Maybe they're buying in hell, but the, the it's ridiculous. It's totally unfair, and it doesn't it doesn't result in more artistic brilliance or creative brilliance. There's no evidence that uh, Thomas Jefferson mocked it, and he was right to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole idea of intellectual property in ideas. He, you know, he was famously against it, and a number of other very distinguished uh, people. The man who invented the polio vaccine, when he was asked, well, who owns it? He said, well, you might as well say it's the sun. It belongs to everybody. And, and, and that, that attitude, I think, is, is, is what we need. But I'm quite prepared to say, look, there are other ways of encouraging innovation. If you think that we need that, they make big profits from innovation. Uh, it, it, uh, they make huge profits from that. But you could have prizes, you could have incentives, you could have uh, industrial awards, but you don't need these entrenched property rights. And to one of your points, I don't think the public in general knows, like, well, let's go with Spooks or Us and Google, that they funded Google. So in theory, mm -hmm. the trillion dollars that Google is worth, I should be getting a dividend check as a citizen because it was my taxes basically that paid for Google to become Google and Intel and the rest of them. So the average citizen on the planet is an ostrich, right? Their head's in the sand. They don't really care. Now they're starting to care because they're becoming poor, um, you know, because making a million dollars a year now is like you can't live type of thing. So now everybody's like waking up. But it, by the time they wake up, it's too late. But I wanted to touch on something you said a little earlier, talking about the U.S. election coming up. So we have Miss Harris and we have the orange man um, and we're screwed either way. But depending on who gets in and, and you're, you're a smart guy, um, how does that look? Not just like for us, but globally. I mean, I know when I travel around the globe, I hear what people say. Well, it's politicians, sovereign wealth funds. I know who they want to win, um, sure. the military, the whole nine yards. But you're looking at it from where you're sitting. Um, What's your opinion on the, on this, on, on our circus over here? Is it like, I'm, I, there's got to be one better than the other, but like if, if A gets in, what happens? If B gets in, what happens? What do you think? Well, I, Stephen, I, I can give you a short answer. I think most of the world is rigid scared of a second Trump uh, administration. Yeah. I mean, I it, it really is, it really is a scary scenario. It reminds me of constantly of Sinclair Lewis's famous book of 1936, where the book is entitled "It Can't Happen Here," and if, if the the man who becomes the the dictator, he goes around giving speeches. Which I mean, if you read his speeches from that 1936 book, you say, "Hey, haven't I heard this before? Haven't I heard it?" And sure enough, they're, they're words that Trump uses regularly. It's an extraordinary right. book. You should read it, even to the point where the bastard is is shot at. I mean, it, oh, wow. it's uncanny. The book is uncanny. I don't think we around the world are particularly excited by the prospect of a Kamala Harris presidency. If she continues right. the Biden economics and uh, that sort of policy, I don't think it's going to solve, A, the global crisis we're facing, and B, the crisis of the precariat in the United States right. or elsewhere. And, and in that regard, uh, let me tell you a little anecdote, which, if I may, which right. is that in 2016, I, I received uh, uh, an email early 2016 inviting me to go to address the Bilderberg Group. Yes. Now, I thought this was a joke from a lefty friend of mine or somebody, you know, <laughs> so I took no notice. I just took no notice. And a couple of days later, I was in the kitchen and the phone went and there was the secretary of the Bilderberg group saying, why haven't you answered our email? And I said, well, I thought it was a joke. 
And he said, no, 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 we want you to come to address the Bilderberg Group in a castle outside Bremen, a secret <laughs> castle, secret <laughs> meeting. So I said, well, if you're serious and you want to pay my expenses, blah, 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 then right. I'll come and do I'll check. So I checked with all my f- intellectual friends, both in Washington and in Europe, and they, every single one of them said, Guy, go, go, address them. <laughs> And they wanted me to talk about the precarious and basic income. And I got there and imagine how I felt when I stood up and the chief executive of Deutsche Bank introduced me. He was chair and he said, from the left corner, boxing out (laughs) of the left corner is Guy Standing, you see. So I said, thanks very much. And there right in front of me was Henry Kissinger. And of course, when I was a student, he was public enemy number one. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, for the three days I was there, I felt like going up to him and putting my hand on his shoulder and saying, I'm making a citizen's arrest. And, you know, <laughs> it was that sort of thing. So the head of the CIA, head of NATO, head of yeah. IMF, mm-hmm. they were all, all there. Mm-hmm. And I said, look, don't be surprised if later this year, because the politicians are not addressing the precariat, We see Brexit in Britain. Enough people will vote for Brexit and enough people will vote for Donald Trump in November. This was 2016, remember. And then Mm. quite a lot of them were surprised. I remember a number of uh, prime ministers who were there coming up and saying, are you sure? And I said, well, look, you're creating the circumstances in which millions and millions of people are chronically insecure. And as I said in my talk, the precariat is is divided into three groups, three factions. The first faction I call the atavists. These are the people who are falling from old working class communities. They don't have a lot of education. They're falling into the precariat and they are being told by the politicians, bring back yesterday. And Mm. for them, Ideally, for them, yesterday was better than today. So if you promise to bring back, make America great again, or get out of EU and you'll have sovereignty. I mean, all these atavistic uh, populist calls, they will vote for that. And don't forget, that's millions and millions of people. The second group I call the nostalgics. These are the millions of people in the in the... Uh, migrants or refugees who are in the precariat, but they don't have a now. They don't have a today. They don't have a present. They don't Mm. have a home. This group won't vote for the populist far right, but they won't vote for anybody. They're disenfranchised. The third group I call the progressives. And these are the young, mainly the young, who go to college, go to university, and are promised by their parents and their teachers, if they do that, they will have a future. They will have a future, a career. And mm-hmm. they come out of university knowing mm-hmm. they bought a lottery ticket. And that lottery ticket is costing more and more and more. They come out with debt and they come out with no future. Mm-hmm. Now, this group won't vote for the fascists. It won't stay out, but it's looking for a new a new politics, a new, what I call a politics of paradise in the book in the precariat mm-hmm. book and the, and the others. And they're still doing that. But what I think has changed from then, 2011, 2016, to now, is that more of the first group are moving off the stage. They're getting older. They're getting whiter. They're getting mm-hmm. off the political stage. Whereas the nostalgics are growing, migrants, and the progressives are growing. Every day, a new group leaves university and is bulging. And this group is what I find myself talking to, whether it's in Spain recently or in Amsterdam last week, big group who are wanting a different politics. They're wanting an ecological politics. They're wanting a security grown politics. That's why I'm supporting basic income, because they, they, they can understand basic income. They can understand the commons. 
They, un they want a different type of politics from what's being offered by the old social Democrats, by the Democrats in the US, the Labour Party in Britain, the, the various social Democrats across Europe. They're all dead men walking. They're dead mm. men walking. And, and, and it's the British election recently disguised it because the Labour Party got a landslide with 19% of the electorate's support. 19%. That, that's not a majority, but no. the electoral system is so useless now because it's not geared to the modern realities that they are still just getting in. But that means they have a wafer thin actual support. 19% is nothing, you know. So, and, and we've just seen the same in, in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands. Where they were well, and very few people, very few people actually participate in the in the U.S. system as well, and it's uh, well, quite. You know, well, anemic. Yeah. Right. Ours is a real waste. Ours is a real waste. So, go ahead, John. Isn't you know we have a, a part of this 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 new class of people, uh, and the, and the conflicts come because uh, we have the underdeveloped world is in a state of you know total poverty and when we're having this migration into developed countries that that's that's putting pressure on 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 wages and then we have you know the the, the wage pressure that that's come from uh, developed countries uh, affecting you know europe us you know canada uh, so is the core of the issue the the explosion of population and the pressures that it's putting on 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 our current system? No, I, well, there are a number of points you're making there, John. First, first of all, we we have declining population sizes in the OECD countries. We yeah. have a rising death rate among white men, in particular, but we also have very low birth rates. So we're, the, our birth rates in, in all the rich countries are well below reproduction rates. Populations are shrinking. We have a situation in developing countries where there is still population growth, but it's not really the, the, the real crisis in, in developing countries. I've written a book called The Blue Commons. No doubt that's not been on your, on your radar. But it's about it's about how the sea the uh, the sea is our commons, and it's been taken over and subject to uh, rentier capitalism in a new form, and we've we've had a situation where rich corporation corporations from rich countries aided by finance, the World Bank, the IMF, and so on, have been plundering the sea resources all around developing countries. I work a lot in Africa uh, over the years and around the coast of Africa, they've depleted the fish populations, they're depleting the minerals from the sea, they're depleting the sand. Billions of tons of sea sand are exported in and curb causing all sorts of ecological damage because we rely on sea sand for building concrete. You, yeah. you can't use desert sand. Mm -hmm. You have to use uh, sea sand. And each year, 60 billion tons of sea sand is taken from around developing countries, and mainly, mainly. And this the combination of depleting of the resources of developing countries, converting uh, mangroves into export-oriented salmon farming, for example, sending to the rich countries is ruining the, the the coastal areas of developing countries leading to distress out migration they go north or wherever they can and we are partly or largely responsible we the rich countries are largely responsible for their collapsing economies and the incapacity to develop and of course with structural adjustment programs and and use of debt mechanisms, lending to corrupt individuals, often knowingly. We have contributed to this rising problems of distress out migration. And unless we reverse that, 
and make make it sort of habitable in developing countries, we're going to continue to see that particular problem. Right. Yeah. The um, you you make the case that universal basic income is something that some of the precariats see as a solution. Um, and is there a particular implementation of it that you support that you think is is working? I know that there are lots of, there have been many projects where it's been tested in small communities to some, some success, but uh, can you tell us more about your thoughts on basic income and how that could maybe solve some of the precariats challenges and maybe that's part of the struct bigger structural challenges that it, it could contribute to yeah michael i mean you're listening to a man wisely or stupidly has had the experience of putting into practice something that uh, he's been advocating for for many years since 1986 at least when we set up yeah but before that when i was at cambridge We've done pilots. I've been involved in designing and implementing pilots in various countries, and I'm involved in one at the moment. And the, the point I would like to begin with is that the justification for moving towards basic income as an economic right, as the anchor of a new income distribution system, is fundamentally ethical, not instrumental. It's ethical first and foremost because it's a matter of common justice. The, we have private inheritance of private wealth, okay? By definition, that means that people who are receiving vast amounts of private wealth have done nothing to deserve it other than by being out of a particular womb. That, that's, that's not uh, a justification in itself ethically. But we have a situation where we have the commons. The commons ever since antiquity have been those resources and assets which belong to all of us as equally as commoners. The land, the sea, the resources, the air, the minerals, the institutions that were created by our ancestors that are part of our social structure. And if you allow the private inheritance of private wealth, then I believe you should allow for the public inheritance of public wealth. Mm. And the only way to do that is to say it should be paid equally because our ancestors who created our public wealth, I don't know whether your, your father, grandfather or whatever, did more or less than mine and, and Stevens, etc. But we should allow that, that this should be a justification. And I was very touched by a, a, a call I had during COVID which came from somebody working in the Vatican. I'm not a religious person at all, but uh, the Pope was thinking of coming out in favor of basic income precisely on this ground, this mm. rationale, common justice. It's also a matter of, of other forms of justice that I've discussed in the book. The second reason, ethical reason, is it enhances freedom. It enhances the freedom to say no to forms of exploitation and abuse and oppression. And it, it also enhances the freedom to say yes to things you would like to do, but you can't do because of economic circumstances, like caring for your elderly mother or caring for our children more. If you have desperation to go out and keep on a, a low paid job, you can't do that. But the people really would like to spend more time caring for the community, caring for things that I talk about in my new book, Politics of Time. So that second reason, freedom. And the third is it gives people basic security. Even if the amount paid is less than subsistence, less than the poverty line, any amount when you're moving on the road towards a higher paying system, gives people a greater sense of security. And the psychologists have taught us that insecurity shrinks the mental bandwidth. It lowers IQ. Mm -hmm. It's unfair of policymakers, any of us, to expect people who are chronically insecure to make the sort of decisions that you and I would like them to be making morally. They have to do whatever they have to do to survive. 
And many of them do things that they don't like themselves, but they knew they have to do it because survival comes first. Mm -hmm. And yeah. basic security is a human need. It's a human need. Now, what we found with basic income pilots in, in Europe, we did a big one in India, where thousands of people got the basic income. We've done it in Africa, been involved in one in Canada, the ongoing pilots in US cities. There are now something like 200 experiments and pilots going on with basic income. And almost every single one that I have analyzed and been involved in, the first and most important thing that comes out of them is improvement in mental health improvement in the feelings of reduced anxiety, reduced stress, the sort of things that cause heart problems later on, drug problems later on, and all suicidal tendencies. It lowers people's sense of insecurity. For me, mm -hmm. that is fundamentally important. And second, it leads to uh, many forms of improved health, improved schooling attendance and performance. We found this. And please listen to what I'm about to say. It leads to an increase in work, not a de decrease in work. The reason is it gives people more confidence to take risks. It gives people more energy. It gives people long-term health, and therefore they can become more active later on. It leads them to become more willing to do training to increase their skills so that later on they can be doing work with the higher productivity and with higher incomes. These things we've measured in the various surveys and various pilots. And I think that's important, but probably the most important thing of all is that it leads to a sense of emancipation. It leads to women, for example, moving out of abusive relationships. We've seen this in a number of pilots. Once a woman has a little financial independence, she can basically say F off and walk out of an abusive relationship. That is a great freedom. That is a great freedom. And we've seen that in our surveys, both in developing countries and in wealthy countries. Now, awesome. yeah, it doesn't... This has to be implemented on a global scale. If not, you, you have you have a you have an, a problem of people migrating in in larger numbers and creating sort of secondary uh, you know problems in in the countries that provide basic income wouldn't you say no no I, then this i'm glad you raised it john because i was going to raise it this is the reason i never use the term universal basic income mm. people always say uh, that people always say Oh, Guy Stanning is advocating universal basic income. If my book is called Basic Income. And the reason I call it basic income is you would have to say you cannot pay for migrants who are coming into your country. If they come in legally, then they should be given support if they need it, but outside the basic income system. They should have to live in the country as regular citizens for several years before they become entitled to it. Otherwise, you would get the problem you've just correctly uh, identified. And I think that's understood. We've did, when we've done our pilots, we've had to apl apply that uh, rule. We've had to say that only people living in the community at the beginning of the pilot should continue to receive it during the pilot. Whoever comes in uh, would not receive it. And we've applied that rule. I think that makes sense. It's something that people can understand. It doesn't mean you don't help migrants. You should help migrants. If, you know, we're all, I'm a migrant. I don't know about you three, but but I'm certainly a migrant. And and I think we need migrants. Migrants are, are, are the source of growth and health and a good society. And, and they reduce tensions if they're treated properly. We need to regulate things, but... Uh, I don't think migrants should be demonized as some politicians like to do so. You mean the orange man, but that's okay. <laughs> so <laughs> today, apparently in America, all migrants eat dogs and cats. Um, so it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a proven fact. In, 
Right, yeah, okay. yeah, that's, I'd heard that story. And then they found the cat that was the subject. They found the cat was in the basement yeah. all the time. <laughs> and, and, and the dog. You know, the best part crazy, about that crazy. was when, the, when they actually called the city of Springfield and asked the city manager, is this true? And he's like, we have no reports. And there's no missing dogs. There's no missing cats. <laughs> and it was sort of like, dude, what are the lies are you going to tell? I mean, so, you know, it's just and we, it's, it's interesting. On, on the, you know, with the, with the last... With the last couple notes here, Guy, can we, can you kind of summarize for us the, maybe the idea that, you know, one, the precariat is, is a real phenomenon, two, that basic income is something that can facilitate part of the solution, and maybe three, is there, tie back to some of the, the political will, I mean, is there even political will for some of the solutions that you've proposed in your books, like, uh, like further regulations, like um, making sure that uh, making sure that redistribution or progressive taxation happens at a better level. I mean, are there glimmers of hope in terms of what you've seen in the context of what you've seen? Yeah, I do actually, Michael, because I, I think in my new book, I, I do an allegorical final chapter, imagining what a good society would be like in the 2030s. Mm. Uh, if you had a progressive pro uh, precariat uh, set of policies, they're not they're not off the road. They're not utopian. They're practical. I think we need to shift our fiscal policy to what I call eco fiscal policy. Move away from taxing incomes and consumption to taxing public and private bads. We need a carbon tax, for example, because we need to reduce fossil fuel uh, consumption. And that's only going to come if you push up the price. The trouble with a, a, a carbon tax is it's regressive. In other words, mm-hmm. low income groups have to spend a higher percentage. So you can only have it if you guarantee that the revenue from the carbon tax is recycled to help pay for the basic income. Okay, mm. and what I advocate in the books is that a, a, a commons capital fund should be set up with levies from those who are depleting the commons, depleting nature. So various uh, forms mm. of uh, fiscal policy that would put money into the fund. The fund should be investing in in ecologically sustainable industries. And as the value of the fund goes up, you can be paying out a rising uh, basic income. Now, we happen to have a number of models of that. One, it was basically the Alaska Permanent Fund was set up Mm -hmm. in 1976 Mm -hmm. along that principle. And and the the Republican governor, who is a bit of a strange bloke, but he, he came in with it and he joined bien. He joined because... He basically saw it as a rising way of paying out, reducing inequality, reducing insecurity, and paying with the proceeds of the oil industry. But you don't need to do it from oil alone. The Norwegians have done it very well, and others have done it to a certain extent with other resources. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is we need to revive our commons. We need to revive our parks, our open spaces, our public libraries, our sense of social interaction. We need to reverse the privatization that's taken place of our institutions. I'm writing a a book at the moment about how privatization and commodification of our education system Mm -hmm. has has really depleted the commons as as a source of, of learning about ourselves and our citizenship and so on. For me, that those are things that are practicable. I believe that we've got to change the way we look at work and labor. The work that we do that is more valuable than any other form of work is given a value of zero in our measures of GDP. GDP was a concept devised in the 1930s by an American economist, Simon Kuznets, aided by a British bloke called Richard Stone. And it was essentially a measure of the resources mobilizable for the war. 
Mm -hmm. And therefore, they reasoned that women who were looking after children had a value of zero because they weren't seen as mobilizable for war. So all the work that women mainly did looking after children is given a value of zero. OK, now various uh, estimates, official estimates in the United States and in Britain and in other countries have shown that the value of unpaid care for the young, for the elderly, for the disabled, for our communities is greater than the whole of manufacturing and non-financial services put together. Mm. I'm serious. The estimates I give in the, in the book, they're not my estimates, they're the estimates of government statistical bodies. Now, if you said, okay, care is a valuable activity. It's just as valuable as producing guns and whatever, okay? We should value that and put it in our measures of, of growth. Then you'd get a totally different perspective. I don't want to increase GDP growth to 1% or 2% or whatever that might be from the politicians if it means producing more externalities, more pollution, more loss of nature and less care. We should actually want to reorient the way we look at uh, time uses and value things that really matter. JFK, no, Robert Kennedy, Robert Kennedy said that the only problem with, with GDP, this was shortly before he was shot, the only mm. problem with GDP, it measures everything except we most value. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is a pretty strong, what should be an epitaph for right. using GDP as an index of success. And that's what politicians do. And they, but I think it's stupid. A Martian coming down, visiting us, would want to go and get drunk or something because they'd think how stupid this, these people are. So, you know, I think there are practical ways of changing the discourse, changing the imagery, changing the focus. And if you appeal to the precariat with the commons, basic income, eco-fiscal policies, ecological survival, revival, then they'll be motivated and they'll be starting to come out, make those percentages that you mentioned earlier come up, the number of people voting and participating in politics. It's a future. And at the moment, nobody's offering a future. Mm -hmm. Can we do this without China's participation? Oh, no, China has to be. Here. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. I mean, I, this can be done, or I forget which one of you mentioned this. It can be done at local level, as it is in a number of countries, being done at a local level. Or it can be done at national level and eventually international level. We have a, a, a network in South Korea. And in 2016, we had our Congress in Seoul. And a little man came up to me and he said, please, Guy, would you explain, please, please Dr. Standing, would you please explain what basic income means? And I did that. He said, oh, that's interesting. Then he came back at the end of the conference. He said, I'm going to stand for governor of my province. And I said, OK, good. Good luck. Thinking, you know, I never see him again. Right. He stood. He stood as governor, of it, which is one of the biggest provinces in, in South Korea. And he won. And straight away, he introduced a basic income for all young people aged 16 to 24. So 125,000 young people are getting a two years basic income. Then he came to our Hyderabad Congress in 2019. And he came up with his entourage this time because he was then a governor. And he came up to me and he said, Dr. Sanding, I said, please call me Guy. And he said, OK, Guy, I'm, I think I'm going to stand for president. <laughs> and I said, well, well, okay, okay. Well, I took him more seriously than before, but I thought it's still, he said, would you please write some articles in for the Korean media, you know, and blah, blah. I said, sure, I'll do that, which I did. And anyhow, he stood for president. And last year, he, 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 I was following the election and all my friends, and he just lost. He mm. came second. And then he came to our last Congress, and he stood up in the front, and he stood very strong straight and he said i failed so i demanded the rostrum straight away i went up and i said excuse me you didn't fail you went from zero 
to 49.3% of the vote in the presidential election of your country. Next time you will win. And his party, in three months ago, swept the board in parliamentary elections. I will put a lot of money on yeah. he will be the next president of South Korea. And I know from knowing him now quite well, he will introduce a basic income in Korea. So I think things can happen. Things can happen. And, and I'm not all doom and gloom. But it does mean that the precariat has to be mobilized. And people like yeah. you and me have to be on board with that. But we shouldn't be cynical. We shouldn't be depressed. We should say, Kuwait, get these people off the stage. Get the Trumps, the disgusting oh, people, should be out of it. Yeah. You know. But to that point, Kuwait and, and, and Qatar have uh, for their citizens a universal income. More Kuwait, they started it like 40 years ago. That everybody got it's a, not a basic get, income there. Well, kind of, it's 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 a it's kind of sort of right because they pay for things. You get this, you get half. So they realize you got to keep the the masses happy, um, and they and they have the means to do it. So, I mean, they're kind well, of well. They, I mean, the they have a sovereign. They have a sovereign wealth fund. I, I've been know. invited. To, I've been invited various times to Saudi and and right. Qatar and so on. They have, but the, the the trouble with their system is it's it's remarkably feudal. It's okay. it's very hierarchical. They treat the migrants there like scum. Oh, they yeah. they really exploit mm. they exploit them. Yeah. It's a dual a dual society you right. know, to a disgraceful degree. And of course, they treat their women pretty badly. I mean, yeah. you yeah. know, so it's it's not a society that one wants to have as a model for a progressive change. And I think if you see progressive politics as always being class-based. They are always on the side of the emerging mass class. Right. In the 19th and 20th centuries, it was the proletariat, the working class in manufacturing mm. and mining and so on. Today, it's the precariat. Right. And they don't want an agenda that's just talking about jobs, jobs, jobs. Oh, bloody hell. A job is being in a position of, insubordin of subordination to a boss. Right. OK, they'll do it. They have to do it for the rest of it. But don't tell them that that's you're going to find your happiness in the mm. sort of jobs that they can expect. They're looking for a, a, a different way of living, which involves a lot of work. It's not a question of uh, rejecting work. They want to be doing work on their enthusiasms, work on things that are creative, things that are adding to nature. It's, 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 I think it's an exciting time, potentially. But it's also a frightening time, potentially. And I also, I would love to have you come back because uh, at some point we have to end this because uh, we could sit here all day with you, but I know you have a life and you want to go do things. But at some point we can call, come back if you'd like and talk about the carbon tax. And the reason I say that is an article a couple of weeks ago in the FT about how Bezos is gaming that. Like how he's being like, hey, yeah, we'll pay it. But, and they're trying to literally restructure how Amazon and everybody else is paying it. So it goes to your point. If we're going to be fair, we have to be fair um, and not just have like seven people decide what's going to happen. So I think that's that's probably a whole nother show. Um, yeah, we, that it, was, it was very interesting when I read that article. I was like, because I've been doing carbon. I did the largest red deal. No, well, they're, they're, it's, not a, it's not so. a carbon tax he's gaming. It, it, it's yeah. the credit system. And, mm -hmm. and it's, that is that is a it's the current system with trading rights is is balmy right. it's it, it, yeah. they can it's greenwashing or blue washing if whatever mm -hmm. you know in the sea blue washing greenwashing well, on land it's it's yeah. not a proper carbon tax you've got to have a right. proper carbon tax well it's kind of like ESG it all went away like yeah. ESG is sort of like yeah ESG went, it was big for a day and now everyone's like yeah, yeah ESG is a bunch of bs nobody cares anymore um because yeah, nothing's they, they I, I think until you you put something on the table that people go oh i i get it i understand and it's fair Everything everybody talks about, everyone's like, yeah, that's just a bunch of BS. And nobody really cares. Um, yeah. And that also goes to your point of people will have more angst now than they did before. And it's like, what are you going to do for me? I don't really care that you're going to save the planet um, or anything else at that point. Because people can't afford to eat and live and pay electric and do this and that. So I think what you're saying is, is very apropos. Now, whether someone actually does anything other than a nice gentleman in Korea, um, is yet to be seen. I'm assuming the Harris and the Trump campaigns have not reached out to you uh, for advice. 
uh, well, I won't tell you who has reached out, but uh, a number of uh, okay. a number of interesting people have, but not those two particular, not in those okay. two. Um, I mean, I, I I was asked, and I'll end on this if you like, by saying that I was asked to San Francisco a couple of years ago to address a bunch of Silicon Valley big shots. There were more billionaires in the room than than I thought existed, even in San Francisco, and right. and halfway through my talk, which was about rentier capitalism and precariat, blah, blah, blah. And halfway through, one of the richest men in the world came came down the aisle towards me. I thought he was coming up to punch me, you know, for what <laughs> I was saying, you see. Right. And he, he said, Guy, are you saying the system is rigged in our favor? And I said, well, yeah, I am really. <laughs> He said, you know something? I fully agree with you, and it can't go on. Nice. And I found that quite interesting because mm. I promise you that man is one of the richest in the world, and, <laughs> and he basically is understanding, because he's not stupid, that, yep. that we cannot have this continuing chronic inequality with chronic insecurity for a rising proportion of right. our population, with suicide rates rising, with deaths of despair, with mm -hmm. drug addictions, we, you, this this is an unhealthy situation that can't persist without either drifting to the far right, as we're seeing, you know, in various countries, where fascism will be back, or a new progressive Lanka. agenda has to take place. Right, Sri Lanka just did. That. Uh, we'll just we'll have to. Uh, we definitely like need to have you back to uh, to give an update on the things you've seen. What's the what's the latest book that you've written that uh, you think our listeners should should check out? Uh, it's called The Politics of Time: uh, Gaining Control in the Age of Uncertainty, and it's just come out in paperback. It came out earlier in hardback. It's just come out in paperback. I, I've just come from presenting it the big festival in London in in Hampstead, and. Uh, I think it's uh, it, it, it's try an, an attempt to bring many of these things together, Michael, where, mm -hmm. where I'm saying that time is one of the most precious assets we have. It's misunderstood. The ancient Greeks understood time much better than we do. They understood the difference between work and labor and mm -hmm. recreation and leisure, leisure being education and public participation in, in the life of the the polis, the life of society. Mm -hmm. And they, they understood the need to have control. And we have a growing inequality in time. If you're in the precariat, you have no control of your time. If you're up in the elite and the salariat, you have total control of your time. And the book demonstrates that with, with I think, quite interesting data. Um, but, but for me, time is, is a precious asset. And, and we don't treat it seriously enough as a politics, uh, as a policy issue. Could be a good topic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully great. you'll come back and, and we weren't too dumb for you and you can come back and we can talk about more of this, which is interesting. And also no, the other I, book, I, I, um, It Can't Happen Here, we should, you should also read, I think. You, yeah, you should definitely you, so. read that. You I'm actually having it right up on my Please. Amazon now. The only disappointment, Stephen, is that, that I thought we were going to be at a cocktail party together and that you were going to get, buy me a drink, but I don't get the drink. I'll have to make my own. <laughs> yeah. You know what, I, depending on the next time and where I am in the world, right, we can we're well. close, I will show up. We will have scotch and cigars together right. and do the show. Because um, we actually do a cigar show live, which now is going oh, to be I don't like cigars. With, okay, well, I'll smoke from a distance. Wine, wine do. for me. <laughs> one and i'll have scotch and we'll talk it'll be great and if you make it to the states at any point let us know we're all you know there's a thing well, I I'm, found going, out I'm, going, I'm going to washington i'm going to washington uh october the 11th uh to see oh. my daughter so Very uh, nice. and she works in washington so uh but i probably all i'll hear about is the wretched presidential election uh, so yeah I'll, good luck with that swear <laughs> at the tv <laughs> each morning i get up <laughs> So Anyhow, well, listen, it's want, been great talking to you. Thank you so it's much for your time. Talking. Thank you, Guy. Thank, thank you, Guy. Have a great Thanks. day. Really, really interesting. Same to you. Cheers. Same to thank you, you so much. Cheers. All right. Cheers. Bye-bye. That was fascinating. Right. Love that. Really amazing. Um, you should, he should come. He's like Michael Collins. He should yeah, just we're come gonna have like him every there. other month. That's um, right. He's a wealth of information. Yeah. So, 
I like Jesus that. All right. Christ. Before we go to Jesus. before we go to Lost and Found and, and give Guy more kudos, let's just pay a bill. Get the freedom and the flexibility of remote work in the lucrative tech industry. Bend your life around, around the world. Bendicoot is the premier course and community for thriving in a remote tech career. Join the revolution today. Bendicoot.com, official partner of the Lost Dollar Business Club. All yep, right. I liked everything he said. Now we'll see if he really comes back. We know Michael Collins and, and Corey.com like to come back all the time. We'll see if a uh, guy wants yeah. to be one of those returning, returning, returning players. But no, I could listen to him all day. Like I said, no, we could be here for four hours. I don't think yeah. oh, well, there's, a lot, there's a lot of good topics to talk about. And, and his concept of, uh, of time, I'm going to have yeah. to read that book and we'll bring him back to talk about that. Yeah, that I'm gonna get that book too. I wrote that down. And I'm, gonna, I'm also. I just literally when we were talking to him, I ordered. It can't happen here already. So um, now I'm ordered. What do we have for Lost and Found? Well, we got to wait. We're gonna do Lost and Found. We're we done talking about Guy. I think so. John. John. Yeah. Any last words? Okay. What do you sit there and look pretty, John? Hold on a second. Last, yeah, last one. On guy, John. Ever wonder how millions vanish into thin air, or how a single dollar can make all the difference? Join us on Lost and Found, where we dive into the wild world of financial mysteries. From misplaced fortunes to unexpected windfalls, we unravel the stories of people, companies, organizations, and even governments who've lost and found millions. Lost and Found, because every dollar has a story. That's a good, we should have played that before Guy spoke. <laughs> that intro is yeah. more for what he said than the other thing. So, well, no, thank you very much to Guy. That was awesome. Um, we hopefully he'll come back in a couple of months. Yeah. Um, and we're going to talk about his new book, which will be, that's even be more awesome, as they say. So, well, let's get into the favorite part of the show for the fan. Yeah. Lost and found. John, what do you got for us? So, <laughs> in the next two, two days, I don't yeah. know why you laugh because this is, you know, not funny. Everything's oh, yeah. funny to me, John. The uh, world's going to end. Big deal. The International Longshore Association and the U.S. Maritime Alliance are uh, negotiating a new contract agreement right. with East Coast and Gulf Port, uh, Gulf Coast ports. Right. You know, uh, and they're not close to even getting to a deal. And if they shut down the ports, we're talking about five billion per day in of uh, of commerce that gets uh, closed down. So you can imagine that it's it's. I don't know if it's uh, it's hitting the the, the headlines, but mm -hmm. if this actually mm -hmm. happens and it goes on for any period of time, right. you know the, that two point five percent inflation that the government's reporting mm -hmm. is going to go right. way over. You know, way to hell is going to go, and it's going to. Nobody's even reporting problems. that they're negotiating, John. Like the what? New York Times, yeah. just look. I'm looking at the time. I'm looking at the Journal now, and I'm looking at the, the Wall Street and no. the Times. I don't see anything in it about it. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's 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 you know, I guess other other news is more important, but this one is if it That's if it actually funny. happens and it and it goes on for any period of time, it's going to be yeah very disruptive. So you know. Into the world, lot, lost, lot, lots of lost dollars on that one. You think? One happens. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it depends what side of the market you're on. But anyway, uh, it's okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Hell, so, that's you know, just then right. no one's reporting it. Well, John, thank you. That's well, like breaking yeah, news. John, that's, I wish we had a breaking really, news yeah. thing. Do, 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 do. <laughs> that was yeah. breaking news, John. Very cool. And next yep. week, David will be back. So who knows what graphics he'll show up with? So you got that going for you. Right. Yeah. Well, I've got something at, at David's level almost. Uh, or oh. <laughs> almost at David's level with okay. in terms of the humor of it, but might actually be good for HP. Okay. So HP is actually adding AI to its printers. So they're calling it print AI. Everybody's got to get on the AI train. Oh my God. I don't know how you add AI to a printer, but it turns out that yeah. they're calling it perfect output, <laughs> capital P, capital O. And right. what it actually does is actually pretty neat. It'll It'll detect unwanted content like ads, and it'll print yeah. only the text that you desire, like the text and images from a from an article. If you're printing from the from a web page, for example, so if you want that, the ad. 
that, that what's that? Maybe I want the ad. <laughs> but you want the ad. Maybe you want the ad. I want the ad. Don't do that. Your, I want the ad. Is saying no ads on printed content. It's going to focus on just oh. the things that you want. And uh, they're saying that you can curate partners that offer unique photo printing capabilities and other things. So I'm sure this will make HP some other ancillary money. But uh, there you go. AI in printers, HP printers. All right. All right. Well, mine is from The Economist. They have a, yeah. a, a, no. a weekly thing called 1843 <laughs> that comes out. And it comes out with some really obscure, wild stories. So this one, which that's very close to a David story, this is a David story. All right. I'm just going to read the headline, and that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, let me go. Here's the headline from The Economist, 1843. American Satanists are leading the fight to keep abortion legal. There you go. <laughs> so that, to me... Wait, this is, a, this is a, 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 a present story? This is a story that came out on Sunday. Uh, I'm sorry, September 20th, 2024. Um, and it talks about the Americans. Right. It's called the 1843 magazine from The Economist. What began as a troll has become a religion. Um, <laughs> I will tell you, I read this. It is fascinating. Uh, and kudos to the Satan is, uh, or Satan or however you, whatever your names are, um, for having balls and saying, you know, women have the right to choose. Now, really, the article goes into how they eat the babies, drink the blood. But, uh, different story. Um, yeah, but, yeah, Part of it, that's yeah. yeah we don't talk about that part but the fact that they're doing that i thought that yeah, you know what yeah. good for you that's really great so um kudos to them good so good a go. new section of the economist that we need to read more frequently I, I tell you i love the economist some of it they write is just the that the 1843 magazine usually has more in-depth stories they're like the big read yeah. of financial time is sort of like it's like a six seven page read and it'll be like the ukraine war or this or that or korea blah, blah, blah. and this one i saw that i was like I got there you go. I there like you go. the headline and I read like the first couple of paragraphs. I'm like, oh no, I'm reading this. And it like I just it was like a book that just engulfed me. I read the whole thing and I was like, this is fascinating. So I <laughs> I know where I'm gonna talk about it. So I talked about there it. There you go. Lost and found. Okay. Well, great show, gentlemen. Great show gentlemen. for the first live show. So everybody, just so you know, 8 30 every Friday morning, we will be live. So you can watch us or not watch us if you choose. And then it'll be rebroadcasted every Saturday back on YouTube and it'll be podcasted out on Saturdays as well. If you are somebody like a guy or a Michael or a dot uh, com like Corey and you want to come on the show, send us a note at the show and we will have you booked and you can come on and talk about whatever you'd like to talk about, you know, within reason. And if you're from the Satan church, from the economist from 1843, reach out to us. We want you on the show. Oh, um, we can do no human Hexes. sacrifices and everything. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. John, John's willing to be a human sacrifice. He's a virgin. We can throw him in a volcano. We're very excited yeah. about that. <laughs> so whatever we can do, that'll be great. Other than that, gentlemen, it's always good to see you. Um, David, I think, will be back. He's had his fortnight off um, for the fans that miss him. Not, not, yeah. I don't think anybody does. But just in case you did, David will be back next week. Um, and that's it, guys. It's always good to see you. Anything else before we go, John? Nope, that's it. All right, that's Such it. A, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, boys. Always good to Thank see you. everybody. Have a great rest of your weekend, everybody. We'll see you next week. Cheers. <laughs>